Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Welcome to the inaugural episode of Q&A with Renee. <laughs> I'm here with my friend Allison, who I've worked with for a number of years now. I remember before I met you, I had screenshot a photo of you, and I was like, who is this? Such I must... a creeper. <laughs> <laughs> Such a creeper, right? <laughs> screenshot. <laughs> but then I was like, who is this? I must work with this. And so I, I reached out, I must work with this, this, <laughs> this butt to head situation. I messaged and she said, yes, oh. I think I was surprised. So always ask, you never know. And then here we are years later. Years later, many years later. Many years later, yeah. maybe five at this point. Yeah, 2018, 17, 18, something, something like, that. like that. Yeah. Okay, so here she is, Allison Sheeler, <laughs> AKA. <laughs> Bomb Chikawawa. Wait, how do I say, say it how like you would actually say it. <laughs> exactly, and that's how, we, that's how you're supposed to say it. Okay, <laughs> all right, so let's start. Where did you grow up, and how would you describe what you do? Okay, I am from Queens. I currently live in Queens, and I just was born and raised in another part of Queens, so I didn't make it very far. Uh, native New Yorker, and I am a professional acrobat, performer, and coach. My main discipline is contortion, but I also perform some aerial and pole, and I have extensive dance training. Um, so I think performer is a good overall kind of umbrella term. And then, yeah, I coach as well. So. Okay, and let's, let's do a, a quick history of, of how you got to where you are. Like, oh my God. Yeah. It's not going to be quick. Okay, I'm going to do my best. Yeah. So my parents threw me into dance classes when I was like five or six. My older cousins danced, my older sister danced, so it was just natural, like, get the kid out of the house, whatever. Um, and obviously I like, love it now, but I'm told I cried my entire first day, which checks out, because I... <laughs> I'm an anxious person. I have anxiety, so I'm sure my parents threw me in that room, and I was like, who are all these other children? I just cried. And I just cried. <laughs> yeah. And I just cried. Um, but I uh, stuck with it, so I'm, I'm sure my parents paid full tuition, so they're like, you're going back. Um, and I ended up loving it, so I did dance um, and dance competition uh, for a really long time. Uh, and then in that studio, I also did I had an acro program, acrobatics. So I did like floor tumbling and flexibility work. So not like full on gymnastics, but like some aspects of it. And then I went to high school and college for dance. I went to LaGuardia Performing Arts High School and NYU Tisch. Um, and so contortion and acro just kind of took a break. Like it was always something I did for fun as like a party trick or a school talent show or whatever. Uh, and then in college, I made a friend who was training aerial fabric. I was like, that's cool. Like I want to try that. And it was so hard. And I was so, I remember the next day I couldn't hold couldn't hold a pencil. Um, so yeah, so I knew that I wanted to keep doing it. It was fun. It was difficult. Um, and so I found body and pole at that time. Shh, Cody. I found body and pole. Um, and I started taking aerial and pole classes there. Fell into the work study program so that I wouldn't have to pay for class. Uh, we're almost at the end of the story. Um, <laughs> instructor, all, and all the instructors there at that time were actively performing. And so they saw what I could do as far as contortion. And they started bringing me in for gigs. And so I was like, I can make money doing this, and like, it's it's a world where I was appreciated for what I could do, as opposed to the dance world, which I feel like is really harsh. Um, and if you don't have a thick skin, you know, like you're constantly being critiqued on what your body looks like, blah blah blah. And in contortion, I was like, oh, I'm just being appreciated for like talent and skill, and the other stuff kind of didn't feel as as important. I don't know. Uh, so yeah, so then I kind of fell into circus. Okay. And so looking back to when you first started to how you are now, like how has your contortion changed? Um, I definitely, well, it's funny because as a child, I was way bendier <laughs> before puberty. Yeah. <laughs> so um, a while, remember when we were doing that 10 year challenge? Yeah. I went on Instagram, I was like 10 years ago, the glow up. I was like, fuck this, 10 years ago, I was way bendier. <laughs> but uh, am I allowed to curse? It's too late now. Yeah, it's too late. It's too late now. But um, how has it changed? So I just, you know, the more training you get, the older you get, the more mindful you are. It shapes, I feel like, your, your craft. And so I definitely am more mindful when I train. Um, uh, even just, like, the routines you put together, you have more life experience. Like, I just feel like it, it kind of all adds into your art. But, um, yeah, I also have more access to co and more knowledge of, like, coaches and classes. And when I was a kid, I didn't, know, like, know and my parents didn't know. So... 
I wasn't like, you know, out there getting the best training in the world for contortion because like, right, who knew, right? So I feel like now I just have more access to information and stuff. I would say that you've also gotten just physically stronger because I know yes. you started doing a lot more pull during yes. lockdown. Yes, I am. Um, a lot of people, so I was naturally bendy and I feel like a lot of children, especially that are naturally bendy, um, aren't, always, <laughs> aren't always very strong. Cody is trying to be in this interview yeah. with us. Cross training has definitely become like a big part of my um, routine or my, my training, I guess. Um, so during lockdown, I, I'm sure we all had a little bit of like of a breakdown during lockdown and I didn't want to do contortion. I, you know, I was like, everything hurt. My body hurt. I was miserable. My body workers were closed, blah, blah, blah. So I was like, well, what can I do that is fun? I'm still being active. And so I got a pole at home. Um, and I really just like dove deep into training pull and I, yeah, I found that the cross training was insane. Like I was getting stronger. I was working muscles that I, that, you know, that now you're working all your pull muscles and normally I'm doing handstands and push kind of stuff. So definitely stronger. And I do CrossFit now. So. <laughs> do you even CrossFit? <laughs> I take, I've taken two classes. <laughs> so, and, but that is, uh, I, I enjoy that. I enjoy finding like other ways because you, I just find that like, oh, I just don't want to do the same skill over and over again. Like I want to branch out as much as I can. And it all really feeds into each other anyway. I think it's so important yes. actually just to like cross train your body and do different types of movement. Yeah. yeah. And for physical health, but also for performing when you're like, I can offer all these different skills, right? You increase your odds of getting hired. That's just like another facet of it, right? Like, well, I can do contortion, but I also now do pole and I do, you know, lollipop lira, you know, whatever, champagne pour. Like I do, I do all of these other things. So you kind of increase your chances of, of working also. Okay, so then what are you, is there anything that you're working on in contortion? Any kind of moves? Yes, so I, everything I'm working on is strength based, so um, the, the one arm handstand, the very elusive one arm handstand, which I, you know, if I'd started doing this when I was six, I'm sure it would be much easier by now, but. Wait, but how old were you when you started actually like training Oh, contortion? when I started training, I mean, it's such a hard question to answer because my training was always so disjointed. Like I never had a like proper contortion coach, but I mean, but I would never say I was self-taught, right? Cause I had other coaches. I had dance teachers, I had an acro coach. Um, and there was a lot of going on YouTube and like trying to do what I saw. So, but I would say when I found body and pole after college, I was getting more real like circus training. I found body and pole, I found aerial arts, um, places like that. Um, I now have a handstand coach that I work with. So it was later in life that I feel like my training was very specifically circus oriented, yeah. but um, definitely I've been doing other things up to that point. Um, so yeah, so all of my skills that I'm working on as far as contortion at this point, um, you know, I'm older, I feel like my flexibility is probably going to stay the same. Like, I, I don't think I'm all of a sudden going to get like 10 times bendier. Um, how very sad. But so it's all strength based, like handstands, uh, push up skills. Um, I'm also now working some partner stuff, like, which is hard because obviously you need to find someone on the same page as you. So, yeah. Well, when I first met you, you were like, I don't do acro. I don't do acro. So, acro no, is a don't. very, like, so when I say acro, I started acrobatics as in like tumbling and stuff. <laughs> acro, right, like duo acro. It's, I have started, I have a partner that I perform with, which is really fun. Yeah. Um, and I have found that it's all about having a proper partner. So, yeah. you know, in the beginning, a lot of those like acro jams, which are super fun, but like community building mostly, um, you know, and everyone's very eager to like collab and work together. I'm like, no, thank you, because like I don't want to get hurt, and not everyone knows what they're doing, and you know, like it's one thing if you get hurt and you have a desk job, you can still do your job. Like if I get hurt, I actually can't work. Yeah. Um, so I was very like anti <laughs> duo work or duo acro, but now I have found a handful, like a very small handful of bases that I trust, um, and so I, it's fun now. Like if you have a partner that knows what they're doing, it's actually and that you can trust. Like if you should fall, they would do everything they possibly could to catch you. Absolutely, right. So I'm Mendel, I am performing with my partner Mendel, who I love, um, has never let me fall. <laughs> and I was a hot mess when we started. So there are plenty of times where he should have just been like, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <laughs> <laughs> you're bad, like your fault. Um, and he's, he's never let me fall. So it really is important when in doing this stuff to either right, have a proper coach, right? If neither right. of you know what you're doing or to be with someone that really understands what is going on, what's happening. Yeah. 
Yeah, and like maybe safe ways to actually do certain tricks, you know? Yes, um, also communication is very important. I, once or twice, um, and this is how I learned my lesson, like, hey, let me base you, right? I'm like, okay, be very clear with me. Like, what are you doing? I don't like being, you know, manhandled. I need to know what is gonna happen. And they're like, hey, hey, this, this, and then they'll throw me up and do a whole bunch of things that they didn't tell me they were gonna do. Like, that's how people get hurt. Yeah. Like, and this is why people spend their whole lives training with one partner, because you learn each other's cues and, and things like that. So communication also very important. And consent. <laughs> communication and consent. The two C's of life. Mm. <laughs> In all areas of life, yes. <laughs> and what is the fav your, like, your favorite part of what you do? Performing. Um, <laughs> so we've talked about this before, but yeah. um, I, it's, <laughs> it's funny because I love attention. <laughs> And Renee will argue that I don't love attention. <laughs> yes. Well, only because we'll be out shooting, right? And she'll be like, there, there's too many people around. People are watching. There's someone walking by who's not paying attention to us, but he's there. <laughs> Let's wait till he leaves. I know, there's people. Okay, so I like very curated attention. So I love performing. I love going on stage and knowing that I am presenting my best work. I feel really confident in what I'm doing. People are here to either see me or um, see my work or see the show I'm in. And there is this kind of wonderful aspect of um, being introverted in real life. And I actually know a lot of performers that are introverted in, uh, in like their everyday life. And then on stage, it's like your one opportunity to be an extrovert. Like this is my very controlled environment up to a certain point, right? You, you know a number of variables that are within your control and this is where I'm gonna shine, right? So. Uh, on the streets, when people are walking by, I don't, you know, I'm like, I don't want to fall in front of strangers and end up on influencers in the wild. <laughs> so, but like, uh, yeah, so I, you know, I, you've never actually fallen in public, by the way. <laughs> not that anyone has seen. <laughs> My phone is like a graveyard of videos of me falling that no one will ever see. But, uh, yeah, so I've, you know, and I, I love coaching and it's really fulfilling to see people um, succeed and accomplish skills and, and things that they never thought they would. Uh, but my first love will always be performing, for sure. Let's talk about um, gig life because... Hashtag gig life. Hashtag gig life because I know, like, you've done stories and you've talked about, um, you know, pay transparency and asking for what you're worth and not undercutting other performers on a conscious level, yes. right? Like maybe sometimes you don't know. And just, you know, just speaking up for yourself, yeah. like in this entrepreneurial performer lifestyle, is there anything you'd like to expand upon? <laughs> <laughs> yes, so pay transparency is super important, not just in performing, but any, any profession, any business, right? Like when you are encouraged to not talk about how much money you're making, who does that benefit? That benefits the employer, right? That, that does not benefit you at all. Um, when you're discouraged from talking about what you're making, then the employer can be sneaky and decide who makes what, and then there's like um, like differences in rate, and that's where like things get messy. So I, yeah, if there's ever a venue um, and people are unsure what to ask for or they're new to performing, I always encourage people to reach out to me. Not that I am like the be all end all and the final say and whatever, but if you know that I performed somewhere, I'm more than happy to talk about what I asked for, my experience, um, you know, and I empathize a lot with new performers who are just trying to get their foot in the door or people that really need the money. And I, I understand why someone might take a gig that is low paying or just takes every gig because they need the money. That is like a real, it's a real thing. And so there needs to be a little bit of understanding. I get that. But, but also then you water down the market for other people. So um, when you charge below rate, then that person, that job, that venue now thinks it's appropriate. Like that is what they will charge because they know that they can get work for that much money. Um, so I, same thing when people are just starting to perform. I know that students that are trying to break into the business think that they're worth less because they have less experience. And I understand that way of thinking, but it's not true, right? You need to charge what everyone else is charging. There's this kind of like fake it till you make it mentality. Like, you know, you are worth what you're worth. You are, we are all worth, you know, millions of dollars. We're all, but um, it's, it's the same thing. If you come in quoting below rate, then that venue thinks that, that that is appropriate. So Right. But then how do you even know like what, what the rate is? So that is why it's important to talk to each other and ask around. And it, it's, yeah, there's going to be a range. So even when I quote, you know, I say, this is my minimum or, or this is a range which 
what I would charge, what like for what you're asking for. I'm happy to negotiate. I always say I'm happy to hear what your budget is. And you know there's a rate where you're like, I will not do it for that. Right. <laughs> it's way yeah. too low. But so there is a little bit of wiggle room, plus or minus a hundred dollars, plus whatever. Um, but really important. So you ask, you know, even if the venue is somewhere like I reach out to you, right? You've not performed at this venue, but you've performed aerial before. You've performed at a wedding before. What do you normally charge for something like this? And just go from there. I mean, and it's, it's going to be a little different, but you don't want like such a large difference, right? In this scale. Um, and then same thing with just your experience. So money, pay, but also how was this person to work for? Was this person respectful, appropriate? Like just what was your experience? Because I find sometimes that that, that happens also where we don't talk about um like i felt unsafe during this gig or i felt disrespected w by this person and you know sometimes we just like take it and we sit with it and we eat it and we don't ever talk about it but then how many other people are going to go on to work with that person right and potentially have an unsafe experience or you know like i don't know i had such a bad experience now i don't want to perform again like so i just think um transparency and communication and um just like uh, more than the sense of competition, a sense of community is really important, like having each other's backs. In a sense. Right, and I think just even building upon your own experience and, and realizing like what is fair, what is right, how you should be treated. Yeah. Is this worth your time for what you're getting paid? Like that all bundles in together. Yeah, and it does come with just time and experience. I mean like life, right? How many times you look back and you're like, oh, like that shouldn't have happened, right? But in the, yeah. in the moment you don't. So there is a part of it that's, you know, there's a learning curve and have grace and, and you know, be nice to yourself. But uh, I also just think that's why communication, right? Because then someone else might be able to tell you, no, 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 that's not normal. Like, you you know, that person shouldn't be speaking to you like this or, you know, like it's not normal to wait a month to get paid, I don't know, et cetera, right? So um, <laughs> communication. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be the theme, I think, of this, yeah, just, of, of this conversation. It's so important. I just, I don't know, like, and it's, it's life. You know, like I said, it's not just performing. We're just always so discouraged from transparency and talking about money and just talking about things. Like, just talk. Yeah. <laughs> just moving on and talking about your career. My career. Is there anything that has surprised you about where you find yourself in life? <laughs> um, where I find myself in life. Everything. <laughs> Who would have thought I'd be here? Well, like based upon, I don't know, just maybe like preconceived notions or maybe how much you enjoy what you're doing or how much you miss this. I, or... Okay, so there are a few things. I have been able to make a career out of this full time. That's, I, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Yes, I remember my parents being very worried mm -hmm. when I decided to pursue dance and the arts Everyone else in my family has done something like more uh, intellectual, I guess, uh, like a more nine to five route. Um, I remember my parents just being like, <sighs> and you know, like I have lived alone for many years. I, I've never, I mean, I had a roommate right out of college, but like I've never had to live with a roommate. I'm able to support my two little fur babies. Um, I, you know, I'm obviously not rich, but I feel very comfortable. And to be able to do that, doing what I love, like, I'm a little surprised. Like, who thought, you know? Like, so I, I feel very blessed and, and happy, but I guess that is also a shock because it's really, really hard. Every now and then I have to sit back and be like, huh. You know, like, and, and yeah. appreciate and be proud because a lot of people try and it's not possible all the time. Right. So. And also I have to say, like, what you're doing, I think is actually really also normally taxing, just physically taxing on the body. Yes. And the fact that your body supports what you do. Yes. Yes. Also surprising that yeah. we are still here in one piece. However, little plug, I do have body workers. And if anyone watching this needs body workers, I'm happy to refer people to you that I see regularly. Yeah. And this was also like growing up because my parents were not physically active. Like you grew up thinking, you know, a massage is a luxury. Like, you know, you only go to PT when something's wrong. And I remember someone, another performer sitting me down and being like, no, this is a necessity. You're using your body. You have to get body work done. Like it's important. It's not a luxury. And so now I, I've collected a little, you know, group of body workers that I trust because I don't trust just anyone. Um, and I see them as regularly as I can. So sometimes of course, like it's busy and you're like, oh, all of a sudden something hurts and now it's an emergency. But what I try to do is go regularly 
even before something starts hurting right. as preventative care. So right. that, that is very important. And I feel like this is just one of the things that that kind of like factors into like your rate, right? Like all the maintenance that you have to do yeah. to support like, I don't know, even five minutes of contortion, yeah. right? Well, that's, again, yeah. sometimes you'll hear, well, why does it cost this much, blah, 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 you're only doing a five minute set. <laughs> okay, so how yeah. many years <laughs> did it take me to be able to do what you want me to do, right? And then of course, like whatever restrictive costuming you're asking me for and yeah, how many sessions of body work do I need to, like it's so much like an iceberg, right? Like you're seeing this, but like right. how much goes on underneath that you're taking into account. I mean, there's like a wonderful quote, I forget what it is, but it's essentially, right? Like, um, like how it took me thousands of hours to be able to do this five minute set, right? Yeah. So you're not just paying for the five minute set, you're paying for it. Um, but yeah, so body work too. It's all, it's important. I mean, during lockdown, when my, everyone had to close, right? So my body workers were, you know, no one was really operating. I was like, <clears throat> like, don't get hurt. <laughs> and of course you're doing all this virtual teaching. So you're on the hard concrete floor of your apartment. Yeah. Everything's hurting. You're, you know, you're looking at the TV or the, the screen. The screen. Yeah. And you're like, so, um, yes, body work, very important. <laughs> <laughs> we're, but we're in one piece. We're, it's good. I thankfully have not been seriously injured. I have definitely had things that are uncomfortable, but um, you know, knock on wood, <laughs> um, everything has been like fixable. But I mean, that's awesome because I mean, you're performing like several nights in yes. a row. Yeah. Doing what you're doing, sometimes multiple gigs a night, and so. Yeah, and then, and in New York, especially a lot of venues, I just feel like people don't think right. Like your green room might be like a closet, so warm up is really. Like, hard and yeah. I again I feel really lucky that my warm up of course as I get older it becomes more extensive but I've never had to warm up that much um thankfully and I'm not recommending this I think everyone should warm up but yeah so like some venues you're like, well it's I don't know it's like you they actually like did you actually think about having a performer here and what That's they might have to do me. I'm like so, oh, twice now I've shown up to a gig where they want a contortion performance and they have, a, they have a, a stage, but then there's like stuff on the stage. I'm like, did anyone think about this? Like you don't even need to know about contortion specifically, but you want something to happen on this stage. Yeah. And it's full of stuff. Right. Like, so, so yeah, I'm shocked at people sometimes. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's all right. And also though, I mean, I get it because gigs sometimes have all these lines of communication, like, so stuff gets lost, whatever. But yeah, sometimes you show up and you're like, did anybody think about this or? <laughs> yeah. Did any thought actually go into like who will be performing on this stage and what they're going to be doing and how much space they might need? And nope, no, nope. yeah, I just I did a gig recently, and on the stage they had teleprompters and like a big podium, and I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know you're paying for me to be here and you're not going to be able to see me. <laughs> right, Sorry, so no. you're like, maybe I'll just do standing needle like a few times and. <laughs> thing too because right? even if you don't know anything about contortion right so they know, they might not know that it's low to the ground whatever but like you can't have anyone on this stage like you won't be able to see anything yeah I don't know I just got a visual of you like performing behind a podium and it's just really funny <laughs> yeah. you know what the check clears I'm getting paid either way if this is what you want but yeah so another thing that's kind of shocking is like who approved this <laughs> okay so now just to wrap things up let's talk about not American food, but we'll talk about foreign food because you've traveled out of the country. Yes. And so let's talk about like what you would actually travel out of this country and go back to, like food wise. Food <laughs> wise. Anywhere. I love food. I will. <laughs> um, well, actually, uh, so where I would go back to and eat food wise, this is not necessarily because the food was amazing, but I, so I was in Egypt in March and I was there with two girlfriends. Uh, so we were like solo women travelers, so we, and we stayed in beautiful hotels, so we just ate really in the hotel. So the food was like great, but it was all just like, you know, I had like a cheeseburger at one point, you know, it was like very American. And I would love to go back with maybe someone who lives there and have a little more of like the local food. So yeah. that would be cool, not in the sense that it was like, I would do that again. It's like, oh, I didn't really get to experience it. I would love to go back um, with someone who kind of knows where can, to go. Yeah, especially with Egypt and to like speak Arabic. Yes. Yeah, yeah, You yeah. know, and... Yeah, and I just... And, like, anywhere. I mean, even in New York, right? You, like, you... Some places are good and some places are not good. Like, I want to know... I want to go to the good you places. You want to go to the good places, not have to guess, yes, not have yes, to, yes. like, 
read TripAdvisor reviews for hours just trying to figure right. out. Right, and then again, like speaking Arabic, I'm like, I don't, I don't actually know what I'm asking for. So, so I would, that would be cool to go with someone who knew a little more what they were doing. Um, as far as where I would go back, so I think this is like the silliest answer, but I was in Germany and I believe that I feel this way because I was on a tour that was very <laughs> hectic. So you performed, you slept, you're on the bus. You perform, you slept, you're on the bus. City, city, city. After, and it was great. Uh, it was like a wonderful tour, but it was very stressful. Again, a lot of just kind of eating the breakfast at the hotel. Um, you go to the grocery store to pick up like a quick sandwich. Like there wasn't a lot of eating the, you know, the cuisine of the country. Mm -hmm. So eventually towards the end of the tour, we must have had like a day off or something. And um, someone else was eating it. And I was like, what's that? They had uh, a gyro, which in Germany is called <laughs> a donor kebab. Mm -hmm. And it's just like a gyro, like you would imagine. But it was the most delicious thing I had ever eaten. And I think this may be because I just hadn't had real food in so long. <laughs> By the time I ate this, I was like, this is everything. And then from then on, that, that's all I ate. Like, I would just eat, like, gyros every day. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, and apparently this, uh, upon Googling, Germany has, like, a very large Turkish and Greek population, which is why there are gyros in Germany. But, yeah, so I would go back. Th those were those were good. It would be interesting to go back and see if they're as wonderful as I remember them. <laughs> right, or if you were just like so deprived of like something <laughs> tasty. <laughs> I'm tired of just bread yeah. for yeah. breakfast. Okay, cool. And that wraps up <laughs> episode number one. Thank you. Thank and you. always feel free to reach out to Allison. She's very responsive and she's very forthright and honest and she actually doesn't really mince words. So. <laughs> <laughs>